Hey guys, today I'm going to talk about my business plan for my store. So the store is definitely happening. We have locked down a location and the contracts have to be signed. Some of the, the store has to be cleaned and remodeled and then we'll sign the contract. I don't see any problems with that. We're paying a dollar, close to $2 a square foot. It is 2,000 plus square feet, so around under $5,000 worth cam and everything else. So here's the interesting part. I have been researching stores, Magic the Gathering stores, and how they closed. In particular, there's one I've always followed, which was MTG Card Market. I followed this store, although it's located in Chicago, mainly because one of the previous partners, was his name is Noah. I have talked to him on LinkedIn. He is the CEO of Immortals, which is used to be a League of Legends team. It didn't get franchised, so RIP Immortals League of Legends, but it does have Overwatch and CSGO. It's pretty much an esports team. And his background is in this MTG, as well as Big Data, which is the same background I have. He's just a lot younger and better at getting investors which his investors, so my investors have like a million dollars net worth, maybe $10 million net worth. His investors have $1 billion net worth. So that's a big difference, right? I've been studying different stores and this is one that I wanted to talk about. Uh, it's located in Chicago. Chicago is a very big city and there's not many stores around it and therefore it should have a dominant market. But it went out of business. Well, it went out of business to become an online store. So it was a retail store with an online website and then it became a fully online store. And I see that happening more and more. Uh, and recently I talked to someone who was interested in selling me the stock of his store and getting out. And I've talked to many of these people because now that I want to open the store, they are all contacting me. I've been contacted by five people so far. Two of them in Texas, one of them not in Texas, and two of them in New York. And not in New York. Oh, so five people in general, just five people. And they all want me to buy their dead inventory, which is a little scary because by definition, their inventory, like I was talking to one of them, like by definition, I don't need to know if it's gonna work or not. So if you buy a new board game that just came out, you don't know if someone's gonna buy or not, but when you are buying inventory of 10 year old board games that have not sold, you know it's not gonna move, so why would you buy it, uh, is what I said. I'm interested in the machines, right? I'm always interested in the soda machines, the Starbucks machines, the hot dog. I'm interested in that type of stuff because my startup, they would eat that up. Like it's a bunch of millennials. Everyone's young. Everyone would love a popcorn machine, a hot dog machine, or and it would just be a cost of business, right? It would just be a cost of the marketing company. So my model cannot be the same as every other model due to the fact that I don't, want to have FNM. I don't want any relationship with Wizards of the Coast. I don't want to sell boxes. Amazon is selling boxes right now for $75 prime. I don't see that stopping. I can I can see Wizards of the Coast cutting a deal with Amazon and then Amazon saying we will lose money to gain market share because that's what Amazon, the reason Amazon hasn't made money or has historically not made money although it's sold so much stuff is they wanted market share. Now they have all the market share, so they can say, hey, you, Cliff Bars, give me this deal. Sell me a Cliff Bar for 10 cents a Cliff Bar. Oh, you don't wanna sell it to me? All right, we'll just do your competitor. Goodbye, Cliff Bar. And that's exactly what Walmart did instead of, but that they did it on the store level, on the physical store level. Amazon's doing that on the uh, digital level or the shipping level. And I could see every, booster box being shipped for $75 for free on Amazon because Dave and Adams already is, comes very close to that price point. They're, they have Dragon Maze boxes a lot of times under 70. They have Great Crash a lot of times under 70. And I've just bought a RTR box under 70. Yeah, RTR. That set that's semi-good for under $70. Free shipping. Not only is it free shipping, they give you stuff. They give you free stuff. 
uh, the Dragon Ball Z things were because I ordered the RTR. So I can't compete and uh, on price, right? So my model is going to be, let's speculate. What do I have that someone else wouldn't have is I have algorithms, I have predictive, I can pull big data, uh, I can pull historical reference as to what cards go up in price, reserve list cards. And I don't need, um, and I can also eyeball it. So like, if I believe in my skill set of identifying valuable cards before they become valuable, Falia, Malera, Archangel, voice of resurgence now i just gotta reprint uh and i would collect a bunch of them stock only 250 cards in my inventory maybe stock some anime too because why not right uh, anime figures and see how it goes and then i would buy so the store would mainly be a buy list and then i would buy all the cards at a really good price i would have to give you more because otherwise you could sell it to a bigger store that's more reliable I'll give you more money for your card than these other stores would if it's one of my 250 cards. And then I would shut down and I'll wait a year. And then I would then see what where the card prices went. And if something spikes, like Chalice, of, Chalice is so obvious. God, like I should have bought that one. Ugh. I was looking at it too. I was like clicking the button. I had like 20 of them. I was like, yeah, should I buy this? And I was like, no, I'm not going to buy it. This is dumb. Because the price point was too high. Like that's the one thing I, the one thing I haven't been able to overcome. I love Liliana the Last Hope, but her price buy-in is not something I'm comfortable with. But if I had investor money, yeah, I would be okay with it because it would offset the risk because it wouldn't really be all my money, right? Now you might pick, oh, what type of investor would be so dumb to do that type of stuff? Well, you know, they trust me. And I have delivered a very high return. I've returned their money and then some over two years. So why would they not invest with me? Right? I mean, unless the idea is totally crazy, but the concept is very simple is every day I make MTG finance videos. Every day I'm looking at what goes up and what goes down. My knowledge base of MTG finance should be higher than the average person's who's looking to buy a card. Therefore, I should be able to predict what goes up and down based on trends and even more so if i had a buy list i could see what people are trying to sell to me and what people are not trying to sell and what the price points are i could easily make an app that pulls the data and these are i think these apps already exist that pulls the data from tcg player it's just an api app it's no biggie uh, i make much more complicated apps in api apps uh based api based apps what api web-based apps than than currently exist, I think, in the marketplace. So yeah, and maybe, maybe I do a trading platform where I list a bunch of cards. Hey, do you want a fetch land? Well, trade me. I mean, Falia is more than fetch land now, but hmm, it's about the same. Okay, you want this fetch land? Trade me a Falia and a, I think Malera is not that expensive. Okay, trade me some value where it's a little bit over and then here's the fetch land. Okay, and then I would trade all the very popular movable cards into, and that's what I did with, um, so the model is based on my actual history with certain cards, uh, Underworld Connection. When it went from eight cents, and I have proof that I bought it from two to eight cents. I bought this card for two to eight cents. I bought hundreds of them. And I would trade, and once they went up to 299, I would trade them into a fetch land. I would trade a play set of them into a fetch land, and this continued. Everyone just knew that they could trade any fetch land for any of these. It could even be packs. So it could be like, oh, do you have a file layer? Let me give you free packs of Aether Revolt or free packs of any of this stuff. That would be my business model would be give you something for your trade-in that is better than the current marketplace, but because I want this card. Now, obviously, I'm, I would have to be very open about what cards I wanted because it's online, right? But I feel like that's good. I, my, my understanding of it is most people in MTG Finance, they really dislike me, so they're not going to affect my card buying anyway, right? They're not going to promote it. So I can slowly, so what I'm not, I'm not interested in spiking a card. That has no value to me because as soon as a card spikes, it's over. I cannot accumulate. So what you guys don't understand about this whole system is 
The reason I accumulate so many falias and maleras and voices was because no one wanted them. The reason I have so many of these crappy reserve list cards that are now like, that reserve list pirate, I have like a hundred copies of that pirate. Uh, no, he's not even on the reserve list. He's just a random pirate in Mirage. It's like five bucks now. The reason I have them is because I liked them and I accumulated them and I accumulated and I accumulated, I accumulated. Falia, I cannot accumulate anymore at 15. It doesn't make sense. So it gets reprinted, it's going to go down tremendously. It is not in the best interest of a MTG finance person to spike a card that they are buying because they would want to buy as many. If you're very confident about that card, you want as many copies of that card as possible. And let me tell you, it takes time. It takes time to buy. It takes time to buy. It takes time to buy. And every time you buy, it gets a tad, tiny bit more expensive because there's less copies of it because you own the copies or they're in the mail. So when I see like these other like articles and things, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like I don't see how like that would be. A, I feel like maybe they don't own the cards that they said they owned and they spiked and they just predicted a spike, but they didn't actually buy the card. B, they're doing a buyout, which like it makes, so buyout is kind of like everyone who bought in early made money and then everyone who's buying out later is not going to make money. So someone loses in a buyout, right? Or C, they just don't really, I mean, they're just trying to get the monthlies, right? They're trying to get the paid subscription. They're trying to get the Patreon money. Like, I'll, I'll just be point blank. It makes no sense to me why if I love Falia, I do not want her price to spike until I have fed on her and just just had so many, like a thousand copies Falia, 10,000 wouldn't even be enough at $2. Right, like if I knew Folly would be a ten dollar card, which I always said I knew, then buying, then I need to accumulate copies of her at two, and I just, but I need time. You're not going to accumulate ten thousand copies overnight without affecting the market. You need to slowly buy into it, and that's what happened to Folly. It took forever for her to get to five. It took forever to get for her to get past two. Like she was always under two, and I have the records. I have the TCG invoices. I have all of this, right? Like it's not fake. When you buy a card, you get an invoice. You just have it sent to an email. Anyway, that is my new card <laughs> business. We'll see. I don't know. I don't know if it's going to work. I'll find out really soon though. Bye guys.